And if I could have the slides, please. Thank you. And we could just move to the, to the next slide. First slide, next slide. So this seminar series will be held <clears throat> every other week, typically on Wednesday or Thursday at four in the afternoon Eastern Standard Time. Today, our topic is the COVID-19 pandemic, what's next? On October 8th, the topic will be COVID-19 and cities in the US. And on October 22nd, we'll ask what happens when we have a COVID-19 vaccine? Please visit the drexel.edu slash Dornsife webpage and select COVID-19 resources to register for the sessions and to get information about future sessions. Next slide, please. So our session today is, is gonna provide a broad overview of a number of topics. We're very fortunate to have three panelists who I, I think are well uh, position to provide this overview. Dr. Esther Chernak is an associate clinical professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, and she is the director of the Center for Public Health Readiness and Communication at the Dormside School of Public Health. Dr. Alex Eza is a professor of global health and community health and prevention here at the Dormside School, and Dr. Michael Levasseur is an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, also at the Dormside School of Public Health. And I will be serving as the moderator for our conversation today. Next slide, please. So our, our presentation today is going to be, a, in a sense, a whirlwind survey of uh, a number of different topics. And successive sessions in the series will go into more depth than on individual topics. But our theme is the COVID-19 pandemic, what's next? And so we're gonna do a broad and, and rather quick survey of where are we now and what are the thresholds that we're standing on? What, what, what do we see when we look across the threshold uh, in the area of epidemiology of the pandemic, what we've learned about prevention, clinical care, and vaccines? And again, there will be a, a full session on vaccines in a few weeks. And, and we'd like to just speculate on what does the future hold? How much longer are we gonna to have to do all these things that we're doing now to, to distance ourselves from one another? What are the big unknowns that might have a big impact on the course of events and the course of, pan, of a pandemic? And what difference might the upcoming US election make in how things unfold in this country? So with that, uh, we'll jump right in and uh, if you could please turn off the slides. So the, the first question I'd like to ask is, where are we? Where do we stand with the epidemiology? Uh, where do we stand here in Philadelphia and our region in Southeast Pennsylvania? Where, where do we stand in the United States and where do we stand globally? Uh, Esther, perhaps uh, ask you to talk about what, where do we stand here in Philadelphia? So it's interesting. Philadelphia is actually at a relatively uh, good place from the perspective of COVID-19 transmission. Uh, I think I was thinking about this when we were having our spring series. We were <clears throat> in a place of high transmission and talking a lot about living through a lockdown to try to get some containment. And um, at that time, you know, our positivity rates in terms of test positivity was, you know, 15 plus percent, sometimes higher in many cases. And um, we're at a place now where I think we have a total cumulative of, you know, 35, 36,000 cases, just under 2,000 deaths. Our percent positivity rate is around two and a half to three percent. It fluctuates. And, you know, the total number of newly reported cases every 
every day seems to me to be around 80 and that, you know, give or take 10 or 15 that's been fluctuating, but that's pretty good for Philadelphia. We're considered green phase. And um, you can see that we're beginning to loosen some of the physical distancing restrictions that we had in place six months ago. We are, you know, there's, uh, there's the city is permitting larger gatherings outside of 150 people. We have been open to outdoor dining and now we're opening to indoor dining at least 25% and that's probably going to increase over the coming weeks. So I think we're at a place where there are wide scale recommendations in terms of, you know, preventing transmission, but recognizing that at the moment, our incidence of disease is, is, is as low as it's been since we've had, since this pandemic has arrived in, in Philadelphia. And I think that we're pretty comparable to other parts of Pennsylvania. There are hotter spots in Pennsylvania, um, and there are certainly hotter spots around the country. We actually, I think if you look at the epidemiology in the U.S., what you see are many different types of epidemics. We have states that have a lot, you know, real surges happening, um, other states that have begun to contain those. And I think Pennsylvania is at a place that's uh, in, in decent control and Philadelphia is probably one of the better locations within the state of Pennsylvania and we're pretty good within the whole Northeast. Oh, thank you. So Michael, do you want to expand on, on Esther's comments regarding the situation in the United States? Yeah, sure. And, and more broadly, I mean, we have, we have a lot of uh, regional epidemics and part of that reason is because each state um, has their own policies for how they're handling the virus. Some places have mask mandates places don't. The testing strategies have been different in different places throughout the, the pandemic. And so you really have seen um, the, the hot spots move, you know, more of the, you know, the Texas region in, in Arizona over into the south. Now it's more around the, um, the, the Dakotas region. And, and you know, that, that is sort of expected with the change in, in human behavior um, because this is a respiratory infection that's spread through, through uh, communities. And so as people gather, in, in, uh, especially in large gatherings, that's where we're, you're going to see some hotspots. But the majority of, of what's happening, the majority uh, that's driving this epidemic is really close contact transmission. And that's going to be in the households. And so we're, we are still seeing lots of clusters occurring in households uh, for, this, for this pandemic. And we're, we're hovering, I think, at around 44,000 new infections a day. Um, I think that's the number that I saw this morning. Um, and, and it's sort of plateauing around that rate as we enter uh, the, the cold season when people are going to be spending more time indoors. And so I think that's something that we're going to have to keep keep an eye on because um, those numbers might start creeping up just because people are going to be spending more time indoors. Thank you. And Alex, how, does, how would you characterize the global situation? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jim. I think globally what we are seeing currently, we are close to, uh, I think, about 32 million infections confirmed and close to a million deaths uh, globally, about 970. So it's really been a devastating uh, pandemic. What we are seeing now is, uh, I think, Esther talked about the resurgence and people are looking at these patterns in different parts of the world and thinking, are we having a second wave? Is there a resurgence? But what we are seeing are different patterns in different places. If I look at Africa, the number of cases has been coming down in a number of countries, in several countries, and they're actually opening up things and we have to see how does that work. If you look at places that have been hit very badly before, you think about Northern Italy, uh, cases have come down there, even though there is some resurgence in, in Europe, for instance, it is happening in countries um, and in parts of the countries where they've not had a very uh, significant uh, outbreak in the past. So there are all these mixes of uh, cases in, in different parts of the world, but the question is whether this is a resurgence, a second wave of the pandemic, or is it just spreading across uh, places where it has not been and maybe um, uh, as we see in, in different places. But generally, it still remains a major uh, threat uh, globally. So epidemiology can, thank you. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to mention uh, when I introduced the session that if you have a question, please post it on the queue and we'll try to get to questions. I know we have a very ambitious uh, agenda. We may not be able to get to all of your questions, but please go ahead and post them on the Q&A. So the epidemiology can provide a lot of insights into uh, how a disease is spread and uh, how, uh, what the relative effect of different preventive strategies 
might be. What, is the, what does the epidemiology tell us about the uh, debate around uh, airborne or, or aerosol and uh, droplet transmission? What does the epidemiology tell us about uh, preventive measures like social distancing and wearing a mask? Perhaps, uh, Michael, I'll ask you to take that. Sure. I mean, so one of the things that we're seeing is that, that these non-pharmaceutical interventions, we call NPIs, the wearing a mask, the social distancing, these have had a, a substantial impact on, on uh, the coronavirus epidemic uh, in terms of reducing the number of cases that we've been seeing. Um, and we're also seeing that places that implemented them earlier are having uh, better outcomes than places that may have uh, come to terms with that a little bit later, um, nationally at least. So um, we, we do know that, that that these interventions are working. Uh, when it comes to this question about is it is it respirat is it uh, droplet transmission or is it aerosol? This is a question that we're probably going to be struggling with for a few years. Um, and I know that with the influenza virus, we've been debating it for for decades at this point about whether it's primarily aerosol or primarily uh, droplet. Um, the epidemiology would suggest that it's still the close contact that makes a difference. The fact that we're still seeing the majority of clusters occurring in uh, small group spaces in, in congregate living settings um, is, is indicative more of the droplet transmission. It's not that I went into an elevator that someone was in 20 minutes ago who had COVID and now I'm getting infected. Um, that said, we have seen some events that, that may suggest that aerosol does play a factor. Um, and that includes uh, the, sorry about that. Um, that includes, um, you know, the choir rehearsal that includes the, the fitness um, uh, instruction in, in South Korea and, and uh, a number of other um, venues where that occurred. But that could also be explained by droplet transmission in a lot of ways. Singing itself produces a lot of droplets that may, in fact, travel further. Working out may produce droplets that travel further. So it's really difficult to sort of to, to pull apart those, those aspects. Not to mention the fact that, that aerosols and droplets are produced from similar processes. Um, so, you know, Droplets are, are sort of the larger version of that process and the aerosols are smaller versions of that. So it's not a binary, it's more of a continuous spectrum of, of size of, of particle. Um, so it, it's, I think it's gonna be a while before we have a clear answer on that. But, but luckily a lot of the interventions that we're, that we're enforcing um, and all practicing are, are, are effective prevention measures for both of those. One of the <clears throat> realities, at least of uh, life in the United States is that the pandemic has has revealed very sizable disparities in terms of race and, and, and ethnicity, in terms of the risk of contracting the disease or the, or the risk of having uh, a, a more severe fatal outcome with tremendous disparities in both the, the rate of disease and the, the rate of mortality, the rate of hospitalizations. Uh, I think for people that work at Public health. This is not a surprise. Where we know that that for many diseases of public health importance, we see this type of disparity. But it brought into focus, I think, more broadly for the American public, the the, the nature of these disparities. Uh, Esther, could you share with us your thoughts on on what what is that about? What what's what's driving these tremendous disparities in in COVID nineteen? Yeah, I mean, I do think that's a big part of the epidemiology of this infection. And I think it's a national phenomenon and something we're also seeing in Philadelphia where we are seeing much higher uh, incidence rates of this infection, much higher risk of infection in uh, communities of color, African-American and, minor, and uh, uh, Hispanic individuals. And we're seeing much higher rates of complication, hospitalization and co severe consequences. <laughs> Now, our colleague here at Drexel, uh, Cheryl Barber, has written a really uh, compelling brief uh, sort of looking at the factors that contribute to those disparities and looking at issues related to systemic racism and redlining and opportunities related to residential life as well as you know, work. And there's so many kinds of social determinants that really probably are driving these disparities. Um, but it's a huge issue. And, you know, there are so many things that people have talked about is, you know, we know that people with underlying medical 
medical conditions are at higher risk for severe consequences and perhaps even of infection, and that's a part of it. But they are also have probably, these communities are probably less likely to be able to work from home, uh, meeting by Zoom all day. And so they're forced into situations where they're having close contact with other people. Uh, they're in high risk professions that probably don't afford them personal protective measures. Um, so there's probably lots of factors, but uh, I think the lion's share are very likely to be social determinants of health that pertain to things like uh, where, where you live, how you live, living in more congested environments, but also in more crowded environments, and working in situations that increase risk um, and don't afford those prote don't afford the protections against this disease. And Thank you. Al oh, sorry, to healthcare, etc. Mm -hmm. Alex, do we see disparities in other? countries uh, along ethnic lines or along lines of, uh, of uh, wealth or, or poverty? Is this a distinctly a U.S. phenomenon or is this a more global phenomenon? Well, I think the U.S. is unique in some ways, but uh, also the patterns that we've seen here, particularly across socioeconomic uh, groups, do exist in many other places. As Esther mentioned, the jobs that people do and who get into what types of professions will affect the exposure to the risk of infection. And uh, we also do know across many different countries, inequities in health is a major factor um, across different uh, settings that uh, it does exist in rich countries, in poor countries. And that relates to the underlying health status of uh, various groups. So in if I look through Africa, for instance, one of the things which is not an um, between, uh, particularly if you think of uh, Uganda, for instance, 80% um, of their cases came through truck drivers from neighboring countries uh, like Tanzania and Kenya and, the, and things like that. So people within those border spaces get more exposed to, to the risk and, and things like that. We've, but again, um, if you think about South Africa, you see certain patterns that resemble the US, but it's more also related to the economics and uh, where people live and who is living in poor urban settings and slums and informal centers uh, cities where the infection might be higher than in, in, in other neighborhoods. So those are the similar patterns that we'll see. In Britain, for example, we see the same racial uh, bias in infection with uh, blacks and other people of color being more at risk and, and, and having those underlying conditions as well. So I think in many ways, as uh, Esther also mentioned, these are the structural determinants of, uh, of health inequities across societies. Uh, COVID-19 is just playing on that same and exacerbating the differences that we see uh, uh, between people within any given uh, country or society. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's move to prevention. Uh, we've talked a little bit about masks. Uh, additional thoughts about what we've learned, perhaps from uh, variations in, in trends for places that have been more or less aggressive and uh, recommending or requiring that masks be worn or more or less uh, aggressive in terms of enforcing social distancing measures, prohibiting uh, gatherings of different size. Uh, what, what do we know about how, how much or how well some of these interventions really make a difference? I guess, Michael, I'll come back to you on that. Sure. Um, I mean, from, from a, 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 a real scientific perspective, some of the studies that have been done on mass usage in the community, and there are very few, and I'm, I'm referring mostly to influenza, um, they, they typically haven't been powered well enough to really answer the question because the real sample size of interest is going to be the number of people who actually get infected. And that's kind of hard to predict. Um, but what, what we could see more, more qualitatively from, from looking at places that have implemented these, uh, these social distancing measures, these, uh, these face mask mandates, is that the infections have, have uh, been smaller than in other places that have not had these. And so that's really where a lot of the, the evidence um, for this is, uh, is being supported right now. Um, and it's, it's really hard to set up the randomized control trial that's required to, to answer some 
these questions more definitively. Um, but you know, at the very you know, at the end of the day, um, face masks uh, have appeared to have a huge impact um, and are going to wind up being really important um, moving forward. I've been really interested in in the way that we've been communicating that message um, as a scientist, and, and some of the communication aspects of this have been really fascinating to me. Um, there was there was a point in time where uh, I was in a radio interview uh, out in Cincinnati. And someone was asking me these questions and they were very much against the, the mass movement. And, you know, I said, you know, we're, we're learning as we go along with this virus about what's important, what's going to be effective. And, um, and the response that I got from the host was that that's unacceptable. That it's unacceptable for us to be learning about this in real time. And I mean, I think that's the reality of science, but you know, these recommendations will change and we will, we will maybe be wrong about more things in the future. Um, but I think that we're going to be more right in the long term than, than in the short, the short term. I'd like to add to Mike's comments a bit about what we've learned in terms of prevention. I mean, I think we have learned that social distancing, physical distancing works as brutal as it can be as a control measure when you lock down society and keep people home for weeks on end. Eventually, you will see a, de a decrease in infections. I think the recognition about the effectiveness of masks um, is a huge lesson. And I think we were slow, frankly, as a public health community to really recognize that masks not just prevent other people, but also prevent also prevent disease in the wearer. They protect both the wearer and the people around them. And I think that has a lot to do with, with the fact that there's a certain percentage of cases that probably are transmitted via aerosol here. I think when you asked before, is it droplet versus aerosol? I think the answer is it's both. We're not always good at predicting how and when it's going to be both, but there are clearly well-documented super spreader events where you have indoor poorly ventilated settings with uh, a couple of people probably shedding a lot of virus, doing activities that are going to uh, create a lot of aerosolization of, of droplets that can be, uh, air, you know, um, tr that can be, you know, transmitted throughout a, a pretty large space, way beyond a six-foot area. So I think, you know, we had this sort of artificial notion of there's big droplets and they only go six feet, and then there's little droplets and they hang out in the air. And I think in reality, certainly with this infection, it's it's a combination of those events. And I think. You know, masks seem to do a lot with respect to both protecting the wearer in those contexts, not perfect, but they're not bad, particularly in most community settings, non-healthcare settings, and they certainly are effective in terms of um, source reduction. And I think we were slow to recommend them as a control measure, but I think if you look at the experience in Korea, even in healthcare uh, settings and even in society, masks probably had a, mask wearing had a lot to do, I think, with keeping infection rates down. And we've seen that in, you know, isolated situations that are well described even in this country, they're, they're making a big difference. And I think that's a huge a huge contribution to our understanding that we that we did not appreciate six months ago. What about uh, indoor spaces that are likely to be inherently more confined, like public transportation? There's somebody that posted a question about we need to be concerned about public transportation, or perhaps a less confined space like an indoor uh, movie theater, where you're going to be there for a couple hours and. and what would you just tell people about about that? So, whether everyone's wearing a mask consistently and and uh, correctly, um, to me that's a, a very important component of it. The ventilation within those settings, particularly within say trains. Um, and, and, and other mo mechanisms of transport. I think that makes a difference. I think probably occupancy rate also factors in, but may, um, you know, all of those things I think are, are part of, of what could make, uh, make it safe to travel on, on mass transit. Or airplanes. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, the problem with things like airplanes um, and movie theaters is people can, you know, you have to, you can't have eating in those situations. You know, you, you take your mask off and um, uh, that's a problem. I mean, with airplanes, you know, there, there's, there is circulation of the air, et cetera, but it's, it's a little bit different. Um, but I think to me, the, the, the big factors, I think that make it safe to travel on mass transit is the percentage of mask wearing occupancy and the ventilation within the various uh, cars or, or mechanisms of transport. And I think it's possible to make things safe. A lot of it has to do with the degree of uh, disease in the community, and, uh, as everything does, right? Um, um, but it's that much more safe 
if in fact the, the, the transmission, if the number of cases is on the low side. So we're going to switch gears again. again well, just, uh, I just wanted oh, to sorry, go ahead, uh, one other thing to also bear in mind is pulling together all the current public health uh, interventions that we are aware of. So you combine mask, uh, mask wearing with uh, continuous hand washing and with social distancing and uh, testing and contact tracing and all of those, you actually have a huge impact. And that's about the only thing that we know at this point to work. If you look at countries and even states within the US, what is it that is making the difference? Nobody has a vaccine yet uh, for this. So is the behavioral um, uh, uh, factors and how well they are implemented how responsible people are about these things that making all the difference in terms of the number of cases and even the deaths that come from this. So I, I think we cannot minimize and underestimate the power of these uh, public health interventions in uh, addressing the pandemic. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, this is really critical. But and also thank you for reminding me that I didn't ask about contact tracing and uh, partner follow-up. Uh, I know uh, I think we, we last discussed this at one of these seminars. There was a lot of discussion about if, if there's an overwhelming amount of transmission in a community, it's not feasible to do, and then you get to a, a certain point, uh, things start to settle down where that can be really effective. Um, what, what's been our experience so far with, with, with uh, contact tracing and the likely impact that that's going to have as a part of this broader mix of strategies. So with, with contact tracing, um, a, a big part of that relies on uh, the public trusting the, the health professionals to properly handle their data. Um, there are a lot of privacy issues around that that the public, I think, um, uh, feels. And, and so in order to properly do contact tracing, you have to have the person who, who is infected disclose all the contacts that they have. Um, and so contact tracing only works if people are open and honest about that. Um, there are some situations where you can, you can you know, think about, well, you went to this, uh, this event and we can attempt to identify all the people that were at that event um, for a contact tracing modality. But I think it really does rely on um, a lot of trust between the public and, and the health professionals who are conducting the contact tracing. Again, each one of these issues is a topic we could spend a, an hour on alone. I do want to switch gears and move on to clinical care. Obviously, we've learned a lot about clinical care. Esther, you're an infectious disease physician, so I'm going to ask you to tell us what, what have we learned about clinical care? What, what's, what's, uh, what's promising there? Yeah, so I guess there's a couple things we've learned. We've learned a lot of just about this spectrum of infection. You know, six, mm -hmm. seven months ago, it was, you know, this was a, you know, a respiratory illness. And, you know, in some scenarios, a severe respiratory illness. And I think we now know that it is a systemic disease for many patients. Uh, you know, some people have hypercoagulable or prothrombotic state. So we see people with clots presenting with strokes. That's a part of the disease presentation. We see people um, presenting with a, you know, a, a multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome that occurs as a post-viral event that's been described in young children. Uh, an immune-mediated phenomenon. We've seen people present with acute kidney in injury and need dialysis. Um, you know, we've seen neurologic manifestations, not just stroke, but maybe primary infection, perhaps, of the nervous system. So I think what we see is that coronavirus infection, SARS-CoV-2, really produces a, a multi-system, you know, uh, has multi multiple systems uh, that it impacts, including the heart. And we're seeing, you know, 15 plus higher percentage of, of cases uh, develop myocarditis and other um, post-inflammatory cardiac manifestations. So we're, we're learning a great deal about this. We're learning that there are people who have the disease and then six months later still have residual symptoms. Long COVID is what it's been called, I think. So um, we still don't know, I think, the long-term sequelae of any of, this of any of these manifestations, much less respiratory failure and the degree to which people will have long-term respiratory compromise. And we're still learning about the possibility of reinfection. And that is, you know, becoming more and more clear that it can happen. And we're just beginning to understand the degree to which that is 
either serious or not serious, I think we don't know. And of course, that's concerning because it has implications for the impact of a vaccine and the durability of a vaccine. And we don't know whether the second infections happen a lot and we're not seeing them. And maybe that's a good thing. They're just happening and the immune system is, is, uh, is fending them off. And what we're, and, or, or maybe we're just, and maybe what we're seeing now are just the severe cases that appear that, and that's how we're picking them up. But there's a lot that we're learning about COVID. And I think we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about something called happy hypoxia, where people basically present hypoxic, you know, having low levels of oxygen in their bloodstream and feel relatively comfortable. And it could be uh, fairly close to having respiratory compromise. We've learned clinically in terms of interventions a number of things to optimize lung function in people with severe disease. We've learned about proning and keeping people uh, stomach down to improve aeration and oxygenation of the lungs and oxygenation of the blood. And there's been a handful of new therapies, not a ton, but a number of new therapies that appear to be efficacious. The, uh, the uh, antiviral compound remdesivir has been shown to be effective in very severe disease. Not, it's not a home run, but it probably, it improves a small percentage of people with severe disease. Uh, probably the best thing we've learned is the impact of steroids, glucocorticoids like um, dexamethasone in severe disease, reducing mortality by at least a third. And that's a, that's a huge finding. And it's also, those are also drugs that are um, been around a while. They're not terribly expensive and they make a big difference. Um, we're learning more and more about other compounds. There's the possibility that convalescent plasma will be effective. I think the jury's still out on that. People were looking at monoclonal antibody, similar principle. Um, we're looking at um, interferon and whether supplemental interferon will make a difference in outcomes. I think what we could use, I mean, so I, we've, so, and we've We've certainly gotten the case fatality rate, particularly in the context of a healthcare system that's not overwhelmed, has gotten much better than it was at the beginning of the pandemic, and our care has gotten better. I think what we're lacking is, you know, a, a simple intervention to give people with mild illness and a way to prevent people with, you know, the early phases of this infection from having cytokine storm and the severe complications of, you know, week two and week three that we sometimes see. So we don't have a, a universal drug to give everyone, but we certainly have gotten better at handling severe disease and improving the outcomes. Thank you. So we've got a couple of questions or comments that popped up. They, they relate back to the epidemiology and prevention discussion, but I think they're important issues and I would like to just acknowledge them. Uh, the, the first is a comment from Professor Charles Haas, who's on the Drexel faculty uh, and is a national, probably worldwide expert on the issue of stuff in the air, uh, infectious diseases in the air. And I think he made the comment that the let me just read his comment. The epi epidemiologic distinction between droplet and aerosol is based on a serious and fundamental misreading of historical evidence and ignorance of basic physics. And I think, Michael, your the way you address that question is, 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 is not describing it as a dichotomy, but describing more of a continuum of, of different sizes of things that might go so far or stay in the air for a certain amount of time yeah. recognizes yeah. that complexity. And for what it's worth, it was conversations with Dr. Haas that, that made me, you know, reconsider some of the things that I had learned in my, in my career as an epidemiologist. So I think, you know, especially it's important to have these multidisciplinary conversations between people from multiple fields um, to, to, you know, be able to communicate uh, those, those liminal spaces between our, our fields. The second question that takes us back to the discussion of uh, prevention uh, concerns the question of, of, of fomites. Uh, our, our conversation really isn't about the air, washing your hands. Uh, you know, the person who posed this question made the comment that we, you know, a lot of people wash their groceries, they <laughs> wipe their mail, are very, very cautious about the things that they handle. Is that, is that overdoing? Is that a misplaced uh, 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 effort? We should really not need to worry about touching things. Go ahead, Esther. I, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that fomites are important in the transmission of this virus. And I think CDC has even backed off a bit on recommending that people wash everything that comes into their household. I think that no longer a widespread recommendation. I mean, hand washing continues to be recommended, but washing um, 
you know, things that come into your household is probably not critical in terms of the transmission of this infection. And it's funny, it's, it, you know, maybe that's low hanging fruit. It's easier in indoor settings to wash high touch surfaces than it is to alter the HVAC system and change the ventilation. But I think the ventilation is a lot more important uh, than fomites are in terms of transmission risk. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you were gonna say that? Oh. Right? No, go ahead. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but I also think that there's a certain amount of, you know, uh, feeling like you have more control over your environment. Um, and so if you feel comfortable doing those things, if they make you feel um, uh, more safe, I certainly wouldn't tell anyone not to do that. Um, and I, I wound up in some discussions with friends about that where originally I was saying, no, that's overkill. And then it's like, well, really, what's overkill in this situation? What's, what's wrong with being more cautious than, than normal? Um, so... That's all I'd say on that. <laughs> okay. So uh, obviously, Chase gives one more time. Chase gives one more time after that. Uh, you know, reading a lot of the news about vaccines, vaccine trials, the different types of vaccines, uh, debates or questions about when will they be available and when they do become available, how much will be available, and how long will it take for more to be available. Uh, and we're going to have a, we had a whole s a session last season on this. We're going to have a whole se session coming up uh, on this. I don't think we need to get into tremendous detail, but perhaps, uh, you know, real quickly, what do you, what do you see as the, the big issues on the horizons with, with vaccines? Who wants to, <laughs> I'll just let whoever wants to jump in. It started on that. I, I was watching a, the Senate hearing this morning uh, with the FDA commissioner um, talking a little bit about, about this. And I, I think, honestly, the biggest thing is going to be the public trust, um, getting people to buy into it. I mean, there, there's an implementation approach to it that is also a concern. Who are we going to give it to first? Are we going to focus on certain communities? It's a limited resource. Is it going to be a lottery? How do, we, how do we handle that? But I trust that we have, we've thought about this in the past for limited resources, and we'll come up with some sort of solution. But it really is the, will people even take it if it's available, if it's perceived to be rushed through, if it's perceived to not be as efficacious, if the communication isn't on point. Um, I know I'll be, I'll be looking at the documentation um, really rigorously when it comes out uh, to, you know, try and, try and form myself and my colleagues and, and my friends and my family. Um, I think that's, that's going to be one of the, the biggest challenges with, uh, with a vaccine. And clearly there's a lot of pretty high level attention being given to the issue of prioritization. I know CDC is thinking about this, National Academy of Sciences has a, has a, has a work group, but uh, do you think people will accept those recommendations? You know, I think it'll depend a little bit on the products themselves, how effective they are or aren't. Um, whatever side effect profile exists or doesn't exist. I think, I think it's hard to know. I think, you know, it, it's, it's, an, it's a fascinating space in some respects. There's a number of products out there that are really novel. You know, we have these mRNA vaccines, we have these adenovirus vector vaccines that in this country haven't been widely used. Uh, there's a lot of novel products out there and the whole pace at which we are studying these and bringing them to phase two trials is kind of amazing. And even just ramping up the whole manufacturing infrastructure while we're doing these phase three trials is, is novel. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, the, I've read that a third of the public is saying they're not gonna get the vaccine regardless. Um, it's hard to know. I think a lot really depends on the degree to which people think the vaccine is safe, the degree to which they think it's protective, and the degree to which they fear the consequences of infection. Um, you know, and it, I, I, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. I think there, there's a lot that will depend on the effectiveness of the risk communication, but a lot will depend on the products themselves and the, the details of, of the, the administration. And especially if it requires a booster shot or some sort of second administration uh, weeks or months after the initial one, that could even, you know, further reduce because then you have people who might get one dose, but not the second. Um, or if they're, you know, subsequent ones that you need to get to, you know, increase the actual immunity. Yeah. And maybe what to add here, excuse me, is um, 
at the moment, I think we have about seven vaccines that are on phase three clinical trials, looking at their effectiveness and safety. The results of that process and the validation of the data that comes out of it will be critical to actually getting public confidence in those vaccines. That will be important. But as Michael indicated, even if you have the vaccine uh, today, I think a more realistic assessment is maybe uh, first quarter of next year, not this year. And but because phase three clinical trials uh, require that length of time to, to be done well. But even if you look at that and you have this um, current strategy to increase the production of those so that we can save time in the delivery of it, the biggest challenge will also be in the distribution of those vaccines. Uh, Michael, you mentioned about uh, the Pfizer vaccine that will require two doses uh, weeks apart. And you need to store it in, I think, minus 94 degrees. And how many facilities do you have in, in which sets in parts of the country that will have that capability? So it's not something you can walk into a doctor's office and get easily. It requires thinking and strategy on how do you strengthen the system of delivery so that even when the vaccine is available, it can actually be accessible to people uh, where they are. And there's an additional issue with the vaccines, in, in, especially in rushing them through, is one of the big questions is how long does the immunity last if one is, if one is seen? For how long does this provide protection? Um, and we won't know if it lasts two or three years until two or three years passes. There's, there's little ability for us to, to really understand that. So, you know, when it comes to the communication, I think that there has to be an expectations game where we're honest about what we still don't know about these vaccines. And Alex, you handed it the infrastructure that's needed to, uh, it's one thing to have a vaccine, it's another thing to get it into people and get it to people. Could you comment a little more on the challenges uh, around the world in, in terms of being able to acquire uh, and, and deliver uh, vaccines? Uh, so if I think of the, say the Pfizer vaccine, for instance, and you want to deliver that globally, it would definitely be a big challenge. The first thing is, if you need to have two doses, of course, it will take time to produce uh, the millions and, uh, of doses that will be hundreds of millions of those that, that will be needed locally. And then once you have it here, the question will be getting it to other countries. And if, if I think of, let's say you get it into Africa, uh, for instance, in many countries, you may have those facilities in the big cities, but how do you get this beyond those? And how long does it last outside of the freezer? And uh, minus 94 degrees for it to still remain effective. There's quite a lot of questions and, and that needs to be addressed. But the, uh, the structural uh, challenges in the delivery system here, I think you need to multiply it like tenfold to see what the challenges will be in many poorer countries because those facilities are completely not available and the delivery systems are not there uh, to, to maximize the effectiveness of the vaccines. And uh, Jim, I want to mention that we really cannot afford to hope on the vaccine as a strategy to counter this pandemic. Given the number of and how infectious it is and all that, of course the vaccine will help, but it is vaccine combined with effective public health strategies that will make all the difference. If we just focus on vaccines, even if it is available tomorrow, we've talked about vaccine hesitancy that only maybe about a third of people or two, even half of them in the US said they will not get the vaccine. So if you don't have large groups of, of segment of the population accepting to take the vaccine, if it is available and accessible, then the herd immunity we expect to receive from it would not be generated if only a third of the population are actually uh, using it. Um, but that said, I think we have to continue with the current public health strategies that we know work. And then when the vaccines become available, we put it on top of the ongoing strategies that have been implemented. That's the way we will be able to get through this pandemic. And, and I think that that's actually the key point 
these things that, that we're discussing, the social distancing, the, the, a lot of the, the contact tracing, the methods that we're using, they're not new techniques. These are things that we've done for decades. Um, and when it comes to how we're going to handle this, we're actually talking about eradication at some point. Um, it's not like this is the first time we've done it. So like smallpox, we didn't go out and vaccinate everyone. Um, in certain places, we certainly had those mass campaigns, but in, in other places, it was more about really high level surveillance and identifying where there are hotspots and going out and, and selectively reaching out to those communities and, and vaccinating them. So it will take a substantial investment in public health globally and also locally. So it's, it's daunting to think about the word eradication with a virus like this. That's hard to imagine that that would ever be possible. But I, I think, Alex, the point you made that there seems to be this perception that, well, once we get the vaccine, everything goes back to normal and, and uh, we, we don't have to wear a mask anymore. Or we can start doing all the things we want to do. And I'm, I'm, what I hear you say is that having a vaccine will be one more thing that we can add to the mix of things we have that will perhaps accelerate that return to normality uh, as economic situation, the impact on the family, the jobs, the children. It's, it's, this is a very difficult situation. How, what's, what's, where's the light at the end of the tunnel? I brought out my little crystal ball because it's probably better at, at answering this question than I am. Um, I have no idea because a lot of it, um, in, my, in my perspective, uh, depends on human behavior. Um, if everyone decides that, that things numbers down and then they started creeping up because people started getting tired. I, I also think that there's there's a, a big um, responsibility for our public leadership, for from our politicians, our local leaders, as well as our national leaders to set a good example. Um, not just a good example, but also set policies that make sense. If people know we're doing this for six months, um, we'll, we'll reevaluate what happens after that time point. It sort of takes some of that guesswork out. Um, but we're still learning so much about this virus and we're still trying to get a handle on it in so many places that uh, it sort of makes some of that planning very difficult. So we're, we're getting a lot of questions on, on the Q&A. I don't know if we're gonna be able to address them, but Michael, you, you talked about uh, clear communication, consistent communication, and, and somebody asked the question, if we can't trust the CDC, who should we trust for accurate information? I think we can trust, um, first of all, I wouldn't say we can't trust the CDC. I actually have great respect for CDC as an agency. And I think, you know, what we're seeing is the politicization of a agency that has an incredible um, infrastructure in terms of science and epidemiology and I have great respect for the career scientists there um, and it's worrisome that we are seeing uh, elected officials who don't have scientific background appear to be um, um, interfering with the work of tracking the pandemic and and you know basically doing the science of public health and epidemiology and uh, formulating the, rec the best recommendations that we would have available. But I, that said, I mean, I think there's still a lot of great information on CDC's website. I think a lot of the stuff CDC puts out in terms of morbidity mortality weekly reports and uh, web-based information and the studies that they are doing in this pandemic are incredibly well done and useful. So I, I mean, and you know, it is troublesome when something's on the website one day and then it's gone or something new is on the website that you don't, that you know uh, doesn't inspire trust and then it's gone. It's hard to understand what's happening there. But for the most part, I, I, I actually think 
Um, I still have a great deal of faith in CDC. It's, an, it's a large organization, it's deeper and bigger than, um, than the politically appointed chiefs of staff who come and go. And, and I'm hopeful that, um, you know, after the, that, that with new leadership at the federal level, you know, um, you know, CDC's reputation will be able to recover, but I don't think the agency is decimated by any, by any stretch of the imagination. I think local and state health departments are putting out remarkable, uh, remarkably high quality and detailed data on, on their websites uh, in terms of local disease trends. Um, and um, you can trust those folks. Um, but I think, you know, and I think you can certainly trust the healthcare professions and physicians, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, people in the medical community who've been very, very vocal on a variety of traditional as well as social media platforms. And um, you know, it's, it's actually amazing how accessible cutting edge science is right now. There's a, you know, um, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's a fire hydrant. There's a lot of stuff out there that, I mean, we talk a lot about the misinformation, but there's also a lot of really high quality information and the key is to be able to sift through it. Um, but there's there's a lot of credible actors out there. I think what we're lacking is, is the unifying leadership, which is what undermines the, th the thrust of public messages. Um, so, maybe, James, if I will add something there, I think you're looking at uh, what next. We, we can't overemphasize the importance of a national strategy for the U.S. It's so critical with, you know, if you don't have that, I mean, when you have a national strategy, you can apply it differentially in different settings, depending on what the local uh, cause of the epidemic is in that area. But if you don't have a national, even a single county in a state trading, up, uh, trading upwards could determine the cause of the, of the pandemic within the state. And that state will also affect what happens in the country. And that's why it is important to have a national strategy. If you have it, then it gives you a roadmap to follow. And you can evaluate how far you're going. But with the current approach, where uh, different states and counties are doing different things, is is confu confusing. And that's what adds to this whole challenge of not knowing where we are and how we are going within this. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would want to say is that, you know, we really do not know enough about the long-term impact of COVID-19. It's been here with us six, seven months, eight months. What happens in two years to people who have been affected in 10 years? In, look at chicken pox or herpes or even HIV. These are viral infections. Even if you get the suppression like um, HIV very low, it still stays in your system. The same thing with chicken pox, with Manifestations of the clinical manifestations that it is it has massive impact in our various in various parts of our body. It affects people, even people without uh, the classical uh, morbidities that we associate with it, can die from it. So when we look at this, we really do not know enough, and that should challenge us to do the basic that we can to protect ourselves primarily. Our families, our communities, and, and, and the country. Because we might realize that two years down the road, actually being affected by it has major health consequences that we do not know at this point, simply because we are just at the starting point of the, of the disease. So that's a, that's a big unknown, isn't it? Uh, one of the questions we posed at the beginning is one of the big un, unknowns. Uh, so I'm going to just step aside from this for just a moment. A question came up about the flu vaccine. Should I get the flu vaccine? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, we know that one of the things we do know is that flu is a seasonal disease. And I would say yes to that question, with or without COVID-19. Uh, uh, but as we, as perhaps as we think about the, the future, the, the flu season is the near term future. Uh, how, how do you think COVID and flu are going to mix? What, what do we need to be worried about there? You know, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think we know. I mean, I think the concern is that 
um, there's the potential for both diseases to circulate at high levels and overwhelm the healthcare system and cause a great deal of morbidity and mortality. I think, you know, at least in the Southern Hemisphere, it appeared that influenza transmission was somewhat diminished this last season, and that may have been because of the aggressive social distancing, physical distancing, and other kinds of respiratory virus control measures that were in place due to COVID. Um, is it conceivable that that could happen this year? It's possible. I hate to voice that because it might discourage people from getting the flu vaccine. And I think that's not the message. I think, you know, I think we don't know what's going to happen. And, um, and I think, but, you know, I think it's quite possible that it might not be so bad if we're still living in a world where for the most part, work and school are virtual and we're all masking and um, there may be less community-based transmission. It's hard to know because the transmission is a little bit different. And to the extent that schools are open and child care centers are open, we might see more influenza um, than, than we anticipate. But it's hard to know. Always a reason to get the vaccine, that's for sure. Yeah, I certainly hope that it's lower than, than, than previous years. I'm going to get my flu shot over the weekend, uh, personally, and I barely go out. I barely leave my apartment, so... So we just have a few minutes and I'm going to apologize now to a lot of great questions that have been posted, but I regret we're not going to have time to get to get to them. But as we as we wrap it up, one of the big unknowns is, is what's going to happen in November. Several of you have alluded to the role, the important role of leadership in a national crisis like this, or it's actually a global crisis. And perhaps, Alex, I'll, I'll turn to you. I, not that we need to predict how one candidate might respond differently, but what, what would you recommend to the next president of the United States in terms of the, the global uh, situation uh, and, and COVID-19 and the role of the U.S. worldwide? Uh, Jim, thank you for that question. As we know, uh, CDC is the U.S. CDC, but actually it is a global institution. In many global pandemics and epidemics, the CDC has been very central in driving the, uh, the research and the management and control of those epidemics, working with different other partners across the world. We have not seen that yet, and even their role within the U.S., as, as people are saying, you don't trust them, not that you don't trust them, there are excellent scientists there still, they didn't disappear, but I think the interference with politics has made it very difficult for them to play that role within the U.S., and that has created a vacuum at the global scene. So, for the next president of the U.S., I will say, let the scientists do the work allow them, let the institutions in the U.S., whether it's the NIH and the CDC and the FDA, let them go through their, their systems and protocols they've developed over decades and centuries. Let them, allow them to use those to manage this pandemic. I believe the U.S., with every single thing that we've done in this country, you will spend the most money uh, in stimulus package and all of those, we have still have the highest number of cases, the highest number of deaths. And with the level of global health, uh, public health expertise in this country, this should not be the case. So I would say, take your hands off this, let the scientists drive the agenda. Let them find the solution and follow it and support them with everything they need to get the U.S. on situation under control, and then let the U.S. rise up and play the role that it needs to play within the global scene. I think, uh, I think uh, another way that, that I would say that, particularly here in the United States, is take full advantage of the resources at your disposal. We have tremendous depth of expertise at CDC, the National Institutes of Health, uh, and our state and local health departments and universities that partner with them. And I think we could take better advantage of the resources that we have, the expertise that, that, that we have to navigate the often political process of implementing public health programs. So we have one minute left. Uh, Alex, thank you for that concluding comment. Michael and Esther, 10, 20 seconds apiece. Esther, go ahead. All right. Esther, any closing comment? Um, thank you for this opportunity. I think we have a tough year or two ahead of us, but I think 
we've learned a lot, a lot about this, and I think we know what works. We have to do it. Oh, great. <laughs> on, that, on that note, uh, thank you to the three of you. It's, it's been a delightful conversation. We, we, when we looked at the agenda, we, we probably could have spent 10 hours or 20 hours on, on this. We, we managed to cover a lot. We obviously, unfortunately, we had to leave a lot out. We couldn't get to all the questions, but uh, it's been a remarkable session, a nice overview. I uh, look forward to the sessions as we go forward that go into more depth on some of these issues. And again, thank you very much to all four of you.